What's your name? <laughs> okay, I'm Rachel's grandpa. My name is Richard Holst. What branch of the military were you in? I was in the Navy Reserves from 1952 to 54. And then I was in the Marines from 1954 to 57. Okay. So... Did you enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted in both cases. Back then, all male 18 year olds and older that were physically fit were obligated to serve eight years in some form of the military, mm -hmm. either active or reserve. Mm -hmm. So I got both of them taken care of. There you go. Uh, what was like your daily schedule for each case, like the Navy and the Marines? Well, in the Navy part, I was just in the reserves, and mm -hmm. we used to go to meetings on a little island in the Mississippi River by Cherokee Park. It used to be called Navy Island. And we would just go down there, and we would learn different Navy tactics and things that we had to know to be sailors. But then in, when I went into the Marine Corps, uh, we went to San Diego, California for 14 weeks a basic training, extremely strenuous basic training. And then after that, I went to Camp Pendleton, California, came home on leave, and then they sent me overseas to Japan. And I served a year and a half in Japan. Okay, so you said your training, your basic training was really strenuous. What did you do? In the Marine Corps, they really stressed strict discipline. They just don't allow any mistakes. They don't allow any back talk. And the reason for that is if you're in combat, they have to count on you to do is exactly what you're told to do when you're told to do it. And that's what one of the things that makes the Marines successful. Mm -hmm. And what, what were, where was your favorite place you traveled? Like, did you really enjoy Japan? Well, I I enjoyed Japan. It's a beautiful country and everything. We climbed Mount Fuji, which is 12,000 feet high. And we went on a lot of long, several mile hikes over there. And we thought that the people were very respectful. Of course, it was only 10 years after Hiroshima. Yeah. And so we did not go to the site of the atomic bombs. Yeah. That was a little sensitive at the time. I <laughs> can imagine. <laughs> Um, do you have like a distinctive memory that stands out? Like anything that when you think of the army in general, just something you like to talk about? Or? Well, I, I can't say that except for in the Marines, they, they kind of break it down mm -hmm. mentally and physically. And then they build you back up the way they want you. And once you complete your training, and then only are you considered to be a Marine. And every Marine has a great deal of pride in their service. And I enjoy, still have that pride. They say once a Marine, always a Marine. So it sounds like you enjoyed Marines. Would you say you enjoyed that better than the Navy Reserve or? The Navy Reserve was very casual. Yeah. See. The Navy, the Air Force, the Army, when they go through their training, if they join the Marines, they have to go through boot camp again. No matter what you've been through, you gotta go through their training. So the other branches of the services are all part of the team mm -hmm. and they're very important, but they're not disciplined as tightly as the Marines. Gotcha. All right. Do you have any people that you were super close to during the time? Like, did you get really close with everybody in your platoon? Or? We were all one, but I had I did get quite close to a fellow by the name of Mickey Hampton. He was from Saginaw, Texas. And he told me, he says, Dick, he says, you're a Yankee, but you ain't a damn Yankee. Because <laughs> they were still thinking Civil War back in those days even. They still do. <laughs> But we got to be very close. A lot of us were very close. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Any? What was your most 
like distinct duty you had to do in the Marines? Okay, when I first started out, I was in Japan, I was in a machine gun platoon. So I was to shoot a machine gun. And then I said, I want to do better than that. So I went into radio opera school. So I carried a radio on my back and that's what you use for field communications. Still later on, I said, I want to be a radio telegraph operator, which is Morse code. So I went to school in Camp Kifo, Japan, and I learned Morse code and how to send and receive Morse code. And I still enjoy that. I hear that on some of the shows and that, and I can still say what, tell what they're saying. What kind of like messages did you intercept or what, what did you do exactly? Was it just <coughs> between officers? It was all operational messages. Mm -hmm. uh, what was our, our present location, where our destination, and uh, detailed uh, parts of the plan, the battle plans and things like that there. So if you were doing a Morse code, like if you had to do the date or something, would you have to type out like 1900 or would you just be able to do numbers <coughs> over Morse code? We, first of all, uh, we had Greenwich time, mm -hmm. which starts from Greenwich, England. And that's where all the time spread around the world starts. So we always had to say, this is May 27th, Greenwich. So we all had a reference point that the, no matter what part of the world they were in, you could always track back to Greenwich time and know exactly what part of the country or, or the world we were in. Gotcha. Gotcha. But we top, you know, whatever they told us to type, we typed, we just keyed it, you know. I had, uh, when I was on the ground forces, I had a key strapped on my thigh. Mm -hmm. And I could tap the Morse code out as I was driving my Jeep. Mm -hmm. Rachel, da 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 And then they would send back and back and forth. How, how long did, was the average message? Like, not very long. Not long. 20 okay. seconds. So was everything like pretty simple, like just short words? Just information as needed. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So what are your views on like more modern wars and like where the army is headed or I've thought about that and, and the wars dating way back to where the Civil War and all those early wars, the enemy was easily identified. They stayed in a group, they carried your flag, you carried yours then even in Germany and Japan, they all wore uniforms. You could tell who the enemy was. Mm -hmm. Not today. Yeah. It's just awful what they do today. They give little children weapons and make them shoot, make them fight. So I'm afraid the soldiers have to kill kids nowadays. And you could never forget that. Yeah. Did you ever have to see like hand-to-hand -hand combat? When I went overseas, the Korean War had just stopped their shooting, but mm -hmm. the war was still considered on. So what they did is they sent us to Japan in case the Koreans broke the truce, then we would go right in there. But I never had to go into combat. And I'm thankful for that. Me too. <laughs> um, what was it like coming home again after like the first time and then the second time? Well, you mean the, from the boot camp and that? Yeah. Okay, the first time we came home, we were just so relieved to be through yeah. with all of that grief. And, you know, the first time most of us had been away from home. Mm -hmm. And it was very nice to come home and see family and friends and everything. The second time I came back from overseas, we got caught in a typhoon. So there was a lot of us were very, very sick. I didn't get sick. But a lot of them did, and so we were sick most of the way home. Somebody was. But uh, I had written a letter to Grandma, and I says, get your wedding dress, because we're going to get married. <laughs> so, so I got home, and we had about two weeks to get our wedding plans situated, and we got married. Where did you guys get married? 
Where? Yeah. In St. Paul, Zion Lutheran Church, Charles and McCubbin. And the uh, funny thing is then when I went back to my next duty station in California, the lieutenant told me, Holst, don't unpack your sea bag. And I says, well, why is that, sir? He says, we're going to send you to be the radio operator on a naval weather ship in the Arctic Ocean. Oh, oh I told him, I says, I'm going to have to tell my wife. <laughs> what wife? I said, I just got married, sir. He says, unpack your sea bag. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the difference in the two times coming home. There you go. I, I, I'm assuming the second time was a little happier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, I think service time is good for everybody just to get through the boot camp part of it. You, you learn some discipline. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else specific you want to talk about? No, no. I, I just always learned to do what I was told when I was told to do it. And that's what it's all about. But the comradeship with other people was great because you always had to depend on somebody to watch your back and you had to watch yours. And that's, what, that's really something to hang on to. So how many of your kids went into the Army? Well, all three of them went into the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, none of them went into the Army or the Navy or the Marines. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course the girls never went in. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the thing is, uh, people are no longer required to serve eight years. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. That was uh, because it was during the wartime. And yeah. You know, they required everybody to do that. Yeah. But uh, it's a different way of life. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I could have told you more interesting things, but it's just uh interesting no, time of life. No, thank you very much for sharing. You're thank welcome. You for your service. I'm glad to have done it. Yeah.